Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus. That was Shane and Shane. Psalm 46. Indeed, our God is our deliverer. God is with us and he is faithful and he is true. And we give it all the praise and all the glory. This is Monday night just after 7 o'clock South African time. This is Lighthouse Radio. My name is Prophet Rion. And on this station, we only declare the truth of God and the truth alone as our Lord has taught it to us as it is written in the scriptures. We are not here to to manipulate the word. We are not here to, to distort it, to bend it in any way to suit any personal needs or agendas. We are simply here to declare the truth of our God. For indeed, according to John 8, the truth of the Lord shall set you free. But then we need to obey it, we need to adhere to it, we need to know it and stand upon it. This is why the Holy Spirit was poured out to lead us in all truth according to John 16. So I greet you in that name above all names. I greet you in the name of Jesus. I greet you in the name of Yeshua. Indeed, may you be blessed. Thank you for tuning in. May the Lord's hand rest upon you. We are continuing with the series of restoration, of restoring the altar in times of apostasy. Um, This week we are looking at loving and fearing the Lord. Um, This is going to be part one next week. Uh, We will also be looking at, you know, fearing the Lord, which is part of restoring the altar, obeying the Lord, submitting to the Lord. So tonight, you know, I want to look at, you know, as I mentioned, loving and fearing the Lord, loving and fearing God, um, because truly, you know, to restore the altar uh, means restoring our relationship with God, therefore restoring our commitment to the covenant. This therefore means we need to once again walk in the love and the fear of the Lord. Now, just from the start, understand that we live in times of, you know, where the world, uh, where we love mankind so much and we love the rights of mankind and we love, uh, you know, everything that mankind wants to believe in. But the problem is we do so at the expense of first and foremost standing up for God's kingdom values, for his norms, for his truth. And that is when you place creation above the creator, that is idolatry. And the philosophical term is humanism. When you regard the needs and the rights of mankind as more important than anything else. So, we need to understand that firstly we have to love the Lord above all else and mankind. This is the, that's the, the greatest commandment and the second commandment is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So, a dilemma for Christians today is to reconcile themselves to either fearing or loving God. You know, for for many people this is almost a paradox you know yeah, how can we fear him and love him at the same time the truth is that that the journey towards loving and understanding God's truth become begins by fearing him in a loving and a respectful way it says in Revelations chapter 1 verse 8 I am the Alpha and the Omega says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty So let us then examine this phenomenon. The alpha of our spiritual journey is to fear him. Therefore to respect and to be conscious of his holiness and purity. And the omega is to love him unquestioningly. And just as God is the alpha and the omega, therefore he exists as the beginning and the end continuously, just so is our journey towards spiritual maturity which leads to to a point where we both fear and love God continuously, with both interwoven and without a discernible beginning or end. To fear and to love Him because 
to us a natural state of our spiritual condition you know this this becomes part of your spiritual condition where you love and you fear him for this becomes intertwined and interwoven, interwoven in our spiritual walk you see we cannot love others truly the way we should unless we love God first above all and we cannot lead a holy and a pure life unless we fear or in other words respect him our Lord as a holy and a righteous Lord to restore the altar cause for the believer to again restore the balance between loving and fearing the Lord so think of a circle there is no beginning and no end just so our spiritual state of being should be like a circle with God as the Alpha and the Omega with the fear being the beginning and the love being the end always flowing always moving never starting and never stopping and a circle speaks of a ring and a ring speaks of a wedding just so under the new covenant we are wedded to the Lord and so his desire is for us to grow so close to him so that our spiritual being is one of constantly flowing with him so we need to reach that point where we love him and fear him at the same time all the time so then it is required for us to lovingly fear him and fearfully love him Job 28 says the fear of the Lord that is wisdom and to shun evil is understanding so based on the scripture to fear the Lord and to love him shouldn't be a dilemma once we comprehend that even though the fear of the Lord may be the beginning of wisdom the end journey of wisdom is the understanding and the application of love so we love through the cultivation of the fear of God we may struggle to comprehend this but the reason is that through a healthy fear we learn to cultivate a God consciousness and by such an effort we draw closer to God and so we learn more of him more of his heart and ultimately more of his love and as we fear the Lord we walk in holiness and purity we walk in his spirit and so we gradually learn what delights him what what love is how to walk in love and at last to know how to administer the walk of love to others you see Jesus should be the foundation and a capstone of our spiritual walk I, I believe we can all agree upon that 1 Peter 2 the Lord is the capstone we are the spiritual house being built together so this is our first and our greatest priority and challenge to get this foundation right secondly we need to build upon the foundation meaning we need to spiritually mature and grow as disciples of God this all speaks of restoring the altar and through maturity comes loving and fearing the Lord at the same time for indeed if we fear him we shall obey him yet we obey also because of love it is also true that many just serve God for what they can and get out of it or in the hope of not going to hell but we should serve and follow God because we love him we respect him adore him and we want to abide in him and so once we have our foundation secure the Lord says then we need to address our next biggest challenge learning to grow through submission and obedience unto the Lord in order to walk in faith to walk in the fear of the Lord and to walk in the love of the Lord for this is vital to understand we need to love the Lord we need to fear him and we need to have faith in him but this doesn't happen overnight this is a process of drawing closer to him denying the self laying down our crowns and following him we need to love him above all else and then love this broken world how we need to fear and respect the Lord and his truth and his commandments which is something which is not being preached about anymore this will then spark life for to obey the Lord is about walking in his will and there is life in his will and obedience comes through fearing him for if we fear him then we will not be walking in rebellion or apostasy which actually leads to death the Lord said in John 14 verse 23 that those who love him will obey him and obedience comes through honor and respect therefore if we love him we shall also honor him which is to reverentially fear him now we need to understand 
that to love the Lord is not a matter of it is not an unhealthy fear it is not a fear that makes you you know tremble with this this un, unhealthy state of the spiritual state or mind the fear that we've got for God is one of true reverence you see one of one of the greatest things that we can learn on our spiritual journey or the greatest understanding that we can reach is who we are and who God is we always need to get that perspective that relationship right we are but man and God is God and once we understand that once we come to that conclusion that realization that he is God and we are man we are not here to call and to tell God what to do but we are here to yield and to submit that is where we begin to walk this path of fearing and to love the Lord this is why I said obedience comes through fearing him for if you fear him we shall not walk in rebellion and apostasy which parts death the Lord said as I mentioned in John 14 that those who love him will obey him it's that simple this is what the Lord said and again you know we're not talking here about being obligated to follow the law we are not here talking about being saved by works but what the Lord says is if we truly love him then we shall obey him because if you love him you shall respect him which means you shall fear him how we need to have faith in his provision in his presence and in his word we must trust and have faith in the supernatural in the impossible and the wondrous indeed to fear the Lord may be the beginning of wisdom but the love of the Lord is the end of wisdom I want to repeat that the fear of the Lord may be the beginning of wisdom but the love of the Lord is the end of wisdom and so to fear and to love the Lord is intertwined and inseparable once we fear and love the Lord we will know the Lord and know our place in the Lord and so we walk in faith and hope therefore let us then begin to seek the Lord so that we may walk in love fear and faith the Ten Commandments is after all all about love the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God therefore it deals with the greatest commandment but the other six deal with our relationship with our fellow man and all of these six commandments speaks about how we ought to love one another instead of hurting each other they deal with respect and compassion they speak of how to live in peace and love with our fellow man by not stealing by not murdering by not coveting by not slandering and bringing someone's name in disrepute in the eyes of God that means walking in love I mean if you look at the world today this is exactly what mankind is not doing you know stealing and murdering and coveting and slandering and bringing someone's name into dispute is, it's become a common practice it is on television it's wherever you turn it has become the norm it's become natural to this world but it is contrary to the heart and to the and to the very essence of God in his kingdom you see for thousands of years the love which should exist amongst mankind has been shattered resulting in war and conflict and violence bloodshed murder hate and abuse in essence rebelling against the Ten Commandments why because we have not followed the fundamentals of the Holy Commandments we have therefore not feared the Lord remember what Jesus said if we love him we shall obey him so if we truly love the Lord we shall obey his commandments now understand you know you get the the two greatest commandments then you get the ten commandments which expounds which is an elaboration of the greatest commandments and then you get the 613 laws of Moses now certainly we are not called to follow the 613 laws of Moses but surely if you look at the Ten Commandments and you look at the spiritual meaning of it what the spiritual nature of it then surely that is the heart of God it is still the heart of the kingdom so 
if we fear, the, if we love the Lord, we shall fear Him, we shall obey, and we shall do what the Lord tells us to do. We shall love Him, and we shall love mankind. After the Lord says, Blessed are the peacemakers. God has called us to live in peace with each other, to live in love with each other. You see, we have no longer, we are, we are no longer respecting the importance of God's laws. His holiness and purity, and so we have failed to live for one another in spirit and truth. Rather, we have chose to live for the self. No wonder, is there, no wonder there is so much death in the world in the form of anarchy and violence and pestilence and lawlessness. We have failed to look after each other, to respect each other and to respect life because we no longer fear God. If we do not respect and fear God's laws and commandments, then we are not going to follow them. And so it is not surprising that mankind has not adhered to the basic principles of taking care of the poor, the needy, and the widows, and the orphans. Without the fear of God, which teaches us about His pure laws and commandments, how then are we going to love Him, and how are we going to love others? It's that simple. God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. The beginning is to fear Him, and then the end of the journey is to know love, and to walk in love. We cannot love without learning to respect and to fear the Lord Almighty. And so placed between the Alpha and the Omega, we begin our journey towards cultivating a God consciousness. We have to learn as we travel this path what it means to God against the folly of spiritual deception. Of the ways of the world, of all the reality and the truth of His presence. We have to learn about the value of the Gospel in order for us to become mature Christians walking in the Omega of our faith, which is love. The two greatest commandments, after all, are to love the Lord and secondly to love our fellow man. We cannot learn to love and to understand the importance of love until we cultivate a healthy understanding and an appreciation of divine holiness and purity, which comes from walking in reverential fear of the Lord. Indeed, love is our hope, our goal, and our sure destiny as believers. We are, sorry, if we are obedient, we will learn to love and walk in love. In the meantime, we fear now, because none of us is yet without sin or perfect in love. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 to 18, Love will come to its perfection in us when we can face the day of judgment without fear, because even in this world we become as He is. You see, in love there can be no fear, but fear is driven out by perfect love. This is what Scripture says. Because the fear is to expect punishment, and anyone who is afraid is still imperfect in love. That is what Scripture says. It says, in love there can be no fear, but fear is driven out by perfect love. In our days, we have failed to cultivate a God consciousness through a reverential and holy fear of the Lord. It is that simple. So once we have a true respect for God, we truly walk in the love of God, then we will not live by unhealthy, by an unholy fear. We will not be ruled by the fear of this world. And that fear is the fear of uncertainty. It is the fear you know, of this world. Um, it is brought on by the crisis of this world. But in God we have our blessed assurance. In God we have our sure footing upon the rock of Jesus. You see, there is no greater argument for the fear of the Lord than is found in Isaiah 11. And it says from verse 1, And there shall come forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse. This is, of course, David's father. And a branch out of his root shall grow and bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and of the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding. And his delight shall be in the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11 speaks of the coming of Jesus who will be empowered by the Spirit of the Lord. But it was prophesied that Jesus, with the indwelling of the Spirit, will delight in the fear of the Lord. How incredible.
If the Son of God and the Holy Spirit delights in the purity and holiness of God the Father, therefore fearing and respecting the Father, then why shouldn't we fear God too? Why shouldn't we also, like Jesus, delight in the fear of God? Psalm 111 verse 10 reads, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and they who live by it grow in understanding. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, The first step to wisdom is to fear the Lord, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So the question remains is why is it that we will not accept the fear of God? Why do we try to explain away the fear of God in Scripture? Why is it that in our unconscious mind that creep up when the Spirit leads us in the revelation of the fear of God? Is it our pride, our arrogance, our stubbornness, or simply our willingness to live for the self and not for God? The reality is the fear of God is no longer spoken about in churches. We shun away from it. We, we, we say, yes, but the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear according to 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 7. Yes, I agree. But that spirit is it, talking about the fear of this world, the fear of the devil. It speaks about the fear that comes by, the, by living for this world. It does not speak about the reverential respect for God. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 10 from verse 12, And now Israel, what doth the Lord Lord God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God in all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Yeah, that's what it says in the Old Testament. It says, What does the Lord God require of thee, but to fear him, to walk in his ways and to love him. Has God changed? No, God has not changed. Scripture says it very clearly. He is still the same today and tomorrow and and yesterday. The same God who spoke to Israel that you must love me, you must fear me and follow my ways. Nothing has changed. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. There is only one way, that's his way. Still today, God expects us of us to fear Him, to walk in His ways and to love Him. For then we shall be blessed. Then we shall walk in life. For that is, after all, in, it encapsulates what it says in Matthew 6. To first seek the kingdom of God, and the rest shall be added unto us. 2 Chronicles 19 verse 7 says, Wherefore, wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. Psalm 19 verse 9 says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Indeed, it is the beginning of wisdom to fear the Lord, and wisdom, after all, guides us on our path. It guides us on the way of Jesus. Wisdom leads us in God's will, and wisdom leads us to follow His word and truth. How can we know how to live or act or behave and speak without wisdom? Without wisdom, how can we possibly live a life in the image of God? Solomon, after all, asked for wisdom from God, and then the rest was added. Very much what Jesus said, didn't it? Jesus said, first seek the kingdom. It is wise, therefore, to seek the kingdom of God, and we seek it in the love and the fear of God. We need wisdom to deal with our finances, we with our work, with our personal life, and with our ministry. We need wisdom from God in all that we do. But how can we walk in the wisdom of God if we are not prepared to take the first step of fearing the Lord? To be wise is to fear the Lord, and to be wise is to love the Lord and to obey His greater commandments. To be wise means following in His footsteps and to speak His truth. True wisdom is the cultivation of the Alpha an omega and a journey in between. To be wise indeed is to fear and to love the Lord. In fact, the great news is that the love of God reflected through Jesus Christ in the New Testament scriptures has the power to cast out unholy and impure faith and set us free. Such un un unholy fear is settled in the self and the self breaks down God consciousness and a deep desire to see his kingdom manifest in every weary heart and soul. So this is what I said, an unholy fear is not what God wants. 
An unholy fear leads us away from being focused upon God. It just takes us away being focused upon His kingdom. It takes us out of that place of certainty and assurity. And it makes us doubt. It causes us to be double-minded. To, to question a lot of things. That's, that's what unholy fear causes. But the fear of God, it grounds us. It, make, it, it brings us to a state of being focused upon the word of God and the truth of God. The reality is there is no fear in love. And I'm talking about true love. But perfect love drives out fear. And this is what we read out of 1 John 4 verse 18. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So again, if John is talking here about the unholy fear that breaks down the true love of God. But the true fear of God builds up the true love of God. So unholy fear breaks it down while the true fear of God, the true respect, will build love up. 1 John verses uh, in the same scripture says 1 John verse uh, chapter 4 also says dear friends let us love one another for love comes from God everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God whoever does not love does not know God because God is love this is how God showed his love amongst us he sent his son and only son into the world that we might live through him this is love not that we loved him but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins Dear friends, since God so loved us, we, can, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. That's 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 to 12. Again I read that. God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. So yes, that's what it's all about. It speaks about the greatest commandment. Loving God first, then loving one another secondly. But if we get that relationship right, if we fear the Lord, love the Lord, then we will love and respect each other. Then it says that love is made complete in us. And that love which comes from God, from a relationship with God, drives out the unholy fear. And then love is made complete. John 15 speaks about how the Lord, if we abide in the Lord, then the Lord abides in us. So if we can get that right, if we can love Him and fear Him and get that relationship right and walk in the wisdom of God, if we can continually abide in the Lord and the Lord abides in us, then we shall abide in perfect love. We shall abide in that perfect love that drives that unholy fear. So we need to remain in Christ who is perfect love, so that by that love we may know true wisdom and true reverence for His holiness. Colossians 3, chapter, uh, verses 1 to 3 says, As since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So once we understand and accept that fear is the beginning and love the end of wisdom, then we can abide in a special appreciation of coexisting truth, the fear of God and the love of God. It says in Psalm 118 verse 4, Let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. We can also go and read what it says in Revelation chapter 14 from verse 7. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the honor of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. You see, we can only appreciate the depth of God's love, spelled out in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when we know the depth and the beauty and the majesty of God. And such journey begins with the fear of God. And indeed, to live in the fear of the Lord is truly a blessing. He desires and causes our good, for He is the source of all good. Unlike the world, He is without partiality and pure in His love and righteousness towards us. As Christians, we follow God's word and are sensitive to the leadings of God's Holy Spirit. In this, we remain in the fear of the Lord. Psalm 25, from verses 12 to 14 says, Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity. Their descendants will inherit the land. 
The Lord confides in those who fear Him. He makes His covenant known to them. So in other words, those who fear the Lord shall be shown a path that He should choose. And He shall enjoy lasting prosperity. And His children after Him shall inherit the land. This is life. And again, please, this prosperity that the Scriptures keeps on talking about. It's the prosperity, first and foremost, of a spirit, a spiritual life that is that abides and has been reconciled unto God. There is no greater treasure to know God and to be known by God and to be redeemed and to be saved. There is no greater prosperity than when your soul, your heart, your mind, your will, your emotions come under the dominion of God where you are at peace and at rest. You don't have inner demons running around in your head. You are at peace and at rest. No money can buy inner peace. No money can buy your joy. That is the greatest prosperity. And you know, thirdly, it is to lead a healthy life, to be healthy in your body. No money can buy that. That is what true prosperity means. To be healthy, to be at peace, to be whole in spirit, soul, and body. Proverbs 14, 26-27 says, He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a man from the snares of death. If we, however, fear anything other than God, we are deceived. God is the only one in the universe worthy of fear. Satan, of course, would disagree and has made an industry out of generating pseudo-fear. To be sure, Satan is truly a terrifying master to those under his care. But those in Christ have been purchased from his mastery and need not fear him any longer. You know, in scriptures, the fear of God is also closely linked to the revelation of his sovereignty. Job 23 verses 13 to 16 says, But he stands alone, and who can oppose him? He does whatever he pleases. He carries out his decree against me, and many such plans he still ends in store. That is why I am terrified before him. When I think of all of this, I fear him. God has made me a heart, my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. You see, to fear God is pure and holy. For through that process we learn love. And how else could we but not fear a God of love, whose love will never fail us, who is faithful and just and forgiving? It is time that the church becomes a place again where our relationship with God is not based upon a simple belief or a doctrine, or a theology. It is God's burning presence in our lives. It is time for us to return to God who is mighty, holy, and pure. Then we shall be restoring the altar. It is time that we act upon Colossians 3, verses 12, which says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. In our own capacity, we do not have the means to love as God desires, yet we can only do so when we abide in His love, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit. We need to truly close ourselves with love by clothing ourselves in His presence, and we draw closer to His glory by fearing and revering our Lord. You know, the, the, the necessity to restore the altar by restoring the love of the Lord in our heart is reflected in Scripture. And it says, therefore, in the following Scripture, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and, there, and, and, and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come after your, after your gift. And that says, Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will be no means get out of there until you have paid that last penny. That is Matthew 5. So as we restore the altar, we become true sacrifices unto the Lord. And then we shall seek the path of peace, reconciliation, and forgiveness. 
And again, as I mentioned, we are called to love God first and above all, and not man above God. We can easily fall in a trap of humanism, which is a rationalist outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. In other words, humanism places the needs and the desires and the wants and agendas of man above the will of God and the way of God. Humanism calls for us to forsake the truth of God for the love of man. If we walk the path of humanism, we therefore walk not in the fear of God, but primarily in the love of man. We can never place the needs and wants of man above the truth and the way of the Lord, for this is idolatry. God's truth is absolute, and in His truth we must love, but then at the same not compromise with the world. You know, the church has steadily over time forsaken the truth and the holiness of God to please man by promoting the needs of man in the name of love. And so homosexuality, same-sex marriages, and the blurring of the gender lines have been promoted, all in the name of love. But this is not done in the name of Jesus. Yes, He is love, but He is also a holy God, and we must love others by first loving and fearing Him. We are therefore called to walk in the love and the fear of the Lord, therefore restoring the altar. As we fear the Lord, we shall love His truth and His ways, and we shall love others as commanded. As we love the Lord, we shall fear and respect His truth and His ways, and we shall uphold the sanctity of life, and we shall respect others and seek to bring them without condemnation to the throne room of grace. More than ever, this balance needs to be restored, for the balance is broken at the moment. More than ever, we need to restore the altar where we commit to loving as He has commanded, but we do so by first loving Him, and then secondly, live a holy and pure life, for our God is holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 16 As we then restore the balance, restoring the altar, therefore, we shall indeed walk in the will of the Lord, therefore walk in life, and to the glory of God. We must return to a place of loving and fearing God. It is that simple. We need to fear Him. We need to love Him. We need to respect Him. The word says in Galatians 5, We shall not mock the Lord. This means we must love Him. We must fear Him who He is. Sadly, we have lost that fear of God. And I am afraid where we say that we truly love the Lord. How can we truly love the Lord if we do not, do not love, if we cannot obey Him and do not fear Him? How can we truly love the Lord if we continually mock Him? So there must be surely a mistake. There must be a problem somewhere. But I feel that love that we talk about, it is not a God that is centered upon, upon God Himself. It is a love that has been created by man to appease our own guilt and our own uh, guilt, guilt-ridden conscience. And I repeat, how can we truly say we love Him if we cannot fear Him and obey Him as the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? May the Lord keep you. May the Lord bless you. May His countenance shine upon you Next week we're going to continue with the theme of fearing the Lord. And truly, as you go out in this week, I pray that you will seek the Lord. Seek Him and you will find Him. Pray for wisdom. Pray that you will walk in the reverential fear of the Lord. For that will lead you on the path of God and on the path of life. God bless. 